but again, thank you to the organizers uh, for the invitation. Uh, if the slides weren't going to be up, I would have thought that maybe there's something against the small molecules. Um, but uh, we are here. Um, I'm going to be telling you about the CD4 mimetic compounds and uh, how they enhance vaccine efficacy against the stringent immune deficiency virus challenge that we have been doing in the past um, two years. Uh, the next two slides is going to be very familiar to all of you. Uh, globally, we know 5,000 new infections uh, per day is happening according to new, uh, uh, UNAIDS uh, in November of 2017, and that uh, accounts to about 2 to 3 million new infections uh, annually. Um, and the global new HIV infections among adults by age and sex is depicted in this slide. And uh, the part that I'd like you to uh, a look at is the 20% among uh, adolescents and young women of 15 to 24 years of age. Uh, the 20% is uh, astounding because uh, that population uh, accounts for 11% of uh, adults. Uh, so you can see that we have a um, uh, you know issue on our hand with these new uh, new infections um, annually. Um, now, how can we? Our goal in the lab is to decrease these numbers in the, uh, these last two slides that I've shown you. How can we do that? And our answer um, is the small molecule CD4 mimetic compounds. So, what are small molecule CD4 mimetic compounds? They are. Uh, do I do I have a laser pointer here? No. Okay. Yes, I'll use the mouse. Um, thank you. So small molecule um, CD4 mimetic compounds are molecules of about 600 Daltons that bind to HIV-1, GP120, and Philip talked about that. Our target is HIV-1, GP120. It binds to the close conformation of uh, the molecule. It goes, it makes it go into the open conformation of the molecule, and it specifically binds to a highly conserved uh, pocket within uh, GP120. Uh, with um, structure-based uh, drug design, we have been able to improve this family of compounds in the past few years, and the uh, structure of the compound you see at the bottom of this slide is what we've been working with uh, in uh, animal studies now. So uh, what it does is the molecule um, binds to GP120. It directly inhibits binding of CD4 to GP120, and it also um, makes the GP120 get uh, activated and go into irreversible inactivation. So we characterize this molecule in vitro, and the next question that we had was, can a CD4 mimetic compound directly prevent infection resulting from a mucos mucosal exposure to HIV-1? And our model was uh, humanized BLT mice from vaginal uh, JRCSF challenge uh, in uh, mice. So what we did was we um, used a precursor to 170, uh, the structure of CD4 mimetic compound that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, we mixed it with um, we mixed it with uh, our challenge virus and we applied it to the vaginal tract of BLT mice, um, and we looked at infected uh, mice. And in the B panel, we looked at it in more of a real-life scenario, where we applied it intravaginally, and then we waited for 30 minutes, and then we challenged the mice with. And in both cases, uh, a high inoculum of challenge virus, we see a, <coughs> we see a, um, those dependent decrease of uh, infection in both mice. And uh, you can see that in the right panel, um, actually we have to go, understandably, we have to go a little bit higher in concentration of CD4 mimetic compound to get the desired effect. Um, so this was a small proof of concept for us that CD4 mimetic compounds specifically and directly inhibit HIV-1 infection. 
in tissue culture, and also in BLT mice. So the next question was, based on our uh, work, uh, we knew that uh, binding of CD4 mimetic compound, CGP120, would cause increased susceptibility to antibody neutralization and antibody dependent uh, cytotoxic uh, cell uh, neutralization. So we asked the questions of do monkeys immunized with envelope immunogen um, raise antibodies that neutralize primary HIV1? synthesized by a CD4 mimetic compound. So in the next few slides, all the results that you see has been done with uh, 170, um, our best to date uh, CD4 mimetic compound. The study design is this. We had three groups of monkeys. In the first group of monkeys, the monkeys were immunized with human serum albumin, and uh, a, a challenge virus was mixed with CD4 mimetic compound 170. In group two, we immunized the monkeys with um, SHIF 505 plate C, GP120, with a vehicle uh, DMSO as a control. Um, DMSO mixed with challenge virus. And in group three, we have immunized monkeys with GP120 and with uh, 170. Um, our challenge vi virus was SHIV C5, which is a heterologous clade C transmitted founder virus. It's a very resistant uh, virus neutralization, resistant tier two, very close to tier three. And we had all the group monkeys, we had three high dose interrectal challenges. So hold on to your seat belts. This is the result of our uh, study. Uh, it's a Kaplan-Meier uh, graph. Um, you look at group um, two, where we just has we just had uh, uh, monkeys immunized with GP120 and vehicle uh, DMSO. No 170. Uh, seven out of seven out of eight monkeys uh, in this um, uh, group got infected after the first challenge. And after the second challenge, all monkeys were infected. In group one, where we had uh, just CD4 mimetic by itself, uh, we had um, three out of six monkeys uh, get infected after uh, um, a first challenge, so it actually was better than um, uh, uh, immunogen by itself. And that goes back to the BLT studies because it tells us again that the 170 directly inhibits uh, HIV infection. Now group three where we have vaccine and 170 is what I'd like you to really concentrate on. Uh, after three challenges, uh, six out of eight monkeys are still protected. That's great news. What it tells us is that uh, small molecule and vaccine induced antibodies are synergizing together to protect the animals from a very stringent uh, virus. So you look at um, the duration of protective immunity in these monkeys. Uh, so this is looking at just group three monkeys. Um, we took the monkeys that were not infected in group three, and we gave them a fourth and fifth challenge. And you, uh, uh, the, the, um, this bar here, uh, Four out of six monkeys after four challenge, after 17 weeks, uh, we, they're still protected. And four out of four monkeys after fifth challenge is protected. Now these monkeys are seeing a small molecule 170. Now you take away a small molecule 170 at 33 weeks uh, by uh, sixth challenge, they all get infected. Um, so it tells us that a CD4 mimetic compound sensitizes primary HIV-1 uh, to neutralization and ADCC uh, by readily eliciting uh, elicited antibodies. And 170 and GP120 induced uh, antibody response are synergized. They work together in protecting monkeys from repeated high dose uh, interrectal challenges with the heterologous transmitted founder clade C uh, shift. Um, so what are we doing now? Um, we have to make these uh, small molecules better. Um, I showed uh, a small um, um, 
part of uh, one of the earlier studies where we know what this 170 binds. We're trying to uh, uh, make the affinity of these molecules better and by increasing uh, the molecules interactions with the outside amino acid cavities within GP120 and uh, that's one of our challenges right now. Uh, we feel like by increasing the affinity of these molecules, we can also increase the coverage and breadth of these molecules, which right now, um, you know, they're okay, but they're not great. Um, so the relevance of vaccine-induced HIV pro prophylaxis, CD4 memory compounds are unique among potential pre-exposure prophylaxis modalities in that they specifically sensitize HIV-1 to host uh, antibody response. They make the host antibody response much better. Uh, sustained release CD4 mimetic compounds should increase the efficacy of any HIV-1 envelope vaccine that's not 100% protective and that elicits antibodies directed against a more open confirmation of uh, envelope GP120. Um, so in the last two slides, hopefully I don't need the ejector seat to <laughs> get out of here, but uh, we are using these uh, small molecules in pod uh, int uh, intravaginal ring uh, system. Uh, we are uh, collaborating with a uh, company in California. Uh, we are putting 170 in uh, uh, pod rings to have sustained release, and our in vitro sustained release data has shown that these rings release about one mil linear release of about one milligram of 170 per day and we will be testing them in uh, uh, monkeys uh, soon. Um, one of the things I want to uh, talk about is uh, last night I was talking to a colleague of mine and we started talking about uh, reshape, which is a, uh, a new think tank in UK to address uh, uh, HIV response. And I feel like uh, with our vaccine, you know, uh, um, uh, modalities, we do need a kind of outside of the box thinking. And the outside of the box thinking right now are these uh, small molecule CD4 memetic compounds to synergize the uh, work that's going on in the vaccine field. Uh, just like it takes a village to raise a child, I think it takes a village to take a molecule to the clinic. I'd like to thank all my collaborators at Dana-Farber, University of Pennsylvania, our chemists, Columbia, Oakcrest Institute of uh, Sciences, which are doing the ring, University of California, Davis, uh, University of Montreal, Duke University, and Bethesda, and all of our funders. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Navid. Um, this is open for questions. We have about one or two questions. Khalid? Maybe? Okay. Um, so can you go back a little bit to the basics? So where and when do you administer the CD4 mimetic? Is it happening during vaccination as an adjuvant? Or is it happening at the time of challenge as well? Like at the time of challenge. At the time of challenge. Yes, at the time of challenge. So with BLT mice, we had BLT mice. Obviously, there wasn't any vaccination. Right. So we just either mix it with the challenge or add it, and then challenge was done. And so, and with the think, monkeys, okay, it's always at the time of challenge. Um, and the washout is how long? Do you the, know uh, the the, P, the PK the half life? Oh, we haven't done that. Th those studies are being done right so, now. So do you think it's direct antiviral, or do you think it's actually changing the immune response? I think it's both. I think in the case of, I think there's some direct antivirals coming, going on, as you saw with group two monkeys. Uh, but I do think, based on our extensive in vitro data, there is a lot of synergy that's going on. And so nice presentation. It has been shown before that this type of CD4 mimetics induce specific antibodies, specifically against the V3 loop. Has that uh, been confirmed in, in this study? And that is also the reason why it is so broad. So it, it uh, even induces antibodies against HIV2. Right. So we have not tested. That's something that we'd like to do at one point. We have not tested anything against HIV2. Um, but with regards to the V3 antibody, you're talking about the actual CD4 mimetic compounds inducing V3 antibodies. We haven't tested that in our lab. Okay. Last question. Navit, thanks for a nice talk. And uh, I, I would like to confirm the, about the monkey model. And uh, have you ever 
detect or determine the neutralizing antibody or ADCC antibody in monkey serum? Yes, so we tested the serum for antibodies, so we used those antibodies in vitro to see whether they would get sensitized by, and they do. Uh, at this stage, I have to look back um, what uh, week, I think we did week 12, 24, and 33. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and now I'll pass on to Tetsuo. Hi. So next speaker is Dr. Uh, Frank uh, Toma Tomake, and uh, he is a senior director of Global Clinical Development Yanfen Company, and uh, I believe he will introduce a uh, long-term follow-up of a uh, great clinical trial phase one two uh, of uh, Adeno and uh, Adeno twenty six uh, with or without MVA uh, expressing uh, GP one forty. So please. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to present this encouraging data. Um, I'm, I am Frank Tamaka, and I am the clinical leader of the HIV vaccine programs at Janssen. Uh, these are my conflict of interests. I work for Johnson & Johnson. I, uh, I wanted to spend a moment to talk about what the goal of our program is. And our goal is to develop a prophylactic HIV vaccine that protects against multiple clades of HIV-1. To do this, we are using heterologous prime boost, a heterologous prime boost strategy using AT26 vectors expressing mosaic GAG pole and MF antigens, and soluble trimeric envelope proteins, GP140, to be determined. Uh, the viral vectors are for the induction of potent cellular and humoral immunity. The mosaic designs are, um, of, are genes for to provide coverage of the globally circulating HIV-1 strains that are responsible for the pandemic. And the soluble uh, GP140 proteins, are co which are co-formulated with aluminum phosphate, are to boost HIV-specific immunity. So I'll be talking about the post-vaccination follow-up data from the approach study. I really don't like, I think I could have chosen a better name than long-term follow-up because this is still data from the main study. Um, and approach is a phase one, two-way randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study evaluating safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity of several vaccine regimens using combinations of Add 26 mosaic HIV, MVA mosaic, and GP140 envelope protein. Now, we took an approach of using a parallel assessment of evaluating these heterologous prime boost regimens. In non human primates, um, in a study that we refer to as non human. I'm sorry, NHP 1319, and also in humans in the approach study. The, uh, based on the parallel assessments of these uh, regimens, we chose as a lead regimen a, a regimen that consists of four injections of AT26 mosaic HIV at four time points, and at the third and fourth time point, also a, G, a injection of adjuvanted GP140 protein. And you'll see the schedule um, a little bit more clearly in coming slides. Now, this data, this week 52 data from the approach study and the non-human primate data was presented 
um, the initial data a year ago at IAS. And um, for more details and specificities, the uh, manuscript was published in The Lancet earlier this month. But as some of you may not be up to date on reading your journals, I will give a little reminder or uh, hint of what was shown up to week 52. So in the non-human primate uh, study, the regimen that consisted of the four injections of AD26 plus two injections, again at the third and fourth time point, of the GP140, there was a 94% per, uh, per exposure reduction of risk of acquisition of HIV-1. And what was most exciting, that there was full protection in 67% of the monkeys after all six of the weekly interrectal challenges. And this was a SHIV challenge. You can see on the left side of the um, slide, the graph, um, and we've only, I've only uh, highlighted or colored the lead regimen and it shows the number of interrectal challenges and what percentage of animals were uninfected at that time point. Now, moving to the clinical trial approach, this uh, phase one, two way study was. Um, considered aspirational, and it was a quite a large study for um, a first-in-human study of uh, AD26 mosaic and also first-in-human combining these regimens. Um, we aimed for 50 subjects in each of eight arms, um, and all arms except the placebo arm, group eight, received an injection of AD26 mosaic HIV at week zero and week 12. The differentiation occurred at third and fourth vaccination at week 24 and week 48 when, if we just pay attention to the blue box, they received um, an injection of the same AD26 uh, vectored vaccine plus high dose GP140, low dose GP140, or no protein. And then groups four, five, and six, instead of AD26 as the viral vector, they received MVA mosaic plus high dose, low dose, or no protein. And group seven was unique in that the third and fourth injection did not include a viral vector, but just the high dose protein. Now, uh, as a, a reminder, um, it, it, up until week 52, all of the regimens were, I didn't mean to do that, all the regimens were generally safe and well tolerated, all were uh, immunogenic, but uh, based on uh, um, the, the immunogenicity data as a whole, combined with the results of the NHP 1319 study, which um, identified um, envelope binding antibody and ELISPOT PTE, ELISPOT as surrogates of protection, we chose group one as the lead regimen. Now, my presentation today, that was background, is the what's happened in the year since the vaccination period, so up to week 96. The demographics all, um, the study was well balanced in regards to gender, as you can see. The, as far as race, it really represents um, where the study was conducted. 56% of the subjects were black, 20 6% white and 16% Asian. And you can see it was truly a global uh, study with 38% of participants from the US, 33% from East Africa, 
pretty much split between Rwanda and Uganda, 14% from South Africa and 15% from Thailand. One year later, as far as safety, there were no vaccine-related SAEs during this period. There were no vaccine-related grade three or four AEs. When we look at the humoral responses over this period, well, this graph gives us the entire period, but what we can see is that all the regimens have similar persistence um, as measured by uh, Clade C. Eliza Titer, but the uh, um, the level of the titer at week 96 correlated with the peak um, response at um, peak immunogenicity at week 52. So in the lead regimen, um, there was a 100% response rate that was maintained for one year after the vaccination period. Now, if we just look at the ELISA titers from the lead regimen compared to that from the monkeys in uh, uh, 1319, we can see that the immune responses um, compare favorably between the two species. But in general, the human responses are higher overall with improved persistence. After the third, what I think one of the most encouraging um, observations is that after the third vaccination, the responses seen in the humans are higher than the responses seen in the monkeys at the time that they were protected from the SHIV challenges. For breadth of immunity, um, the cross-clade humoral responses to envelope are durable in this lead regimen one year after vaccination. You can see that uh, testing nine, nine, a panel of nine GP140 uh, antigens um, at week 52, there are 100% uh, responders to all, all nine antigens. And at week 96, there are still 80% uh, responders to all nine antigens. As far as cellular responses and the dur durability, <clears throat> envelope specific cellular immunity persists in a high proportion of vaccine recipients <clears throat> one year after the final vaccination. The lead regimen here is in the blue um, boulder um, line. And uh, we can see that there is uh, still a considerable responses. Oh, uh, brilliant and polite. Thank you, Khalid. Um, at, at week 96, at, at peak, at week 50, there were 86% res responders uh, by Ellie Spot, and at week 96, there were still 64% responders. So the conclusions of the week 96 follow-up data for safety, there's favorable safety profile over the duration of the study, the breadth, there are broad HIV, envelope-specific cellular and humoral immune responses are induced. And for durability, the responses persist at high frequencies up to one year after vaccination. And the asterisk uh, <clears throat> points out that we have amended this study for a long-term extension where we'll be following the immuno results for five years uh, uh, post um, of post-vaccination. And what is the significance of this? Well, before I even talk about this trial, I would like to say that I think that there's still a lot to learn from this trial. We've collected 
um, samples, uh, rectal swabs, vaginal secretions, um, ejaculate that all need to be evaluated still. I'm looking at Galit. And we have also collected a very significant amount, I can't remember the percentage, but it was quite impressive, of enteric samples for uh, microbiome, which is presently being worked on. Um, I think the long-term, uh, the five-year long-term extension data will be quite informative at helping us determine when a boost will be needed, and we'll have that kind of extent data from other phase 2A trials. But what, what is the most exciting part? I think that, well, the data from this uh, study um, was primarily responsible for uh, convincing ourselves at Janssen and our uh, partners, particularly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, NIAD, and HVTN, to start an uh, efficacy trial in young women in five southern African countries with a target of enrollment of 2,600. And this is called the Imbakoto trial, and it started randomizing subjects in November of 2017, and we expect the first data or the data in 2021. I would like to thank um, our external collaborators and partners. I would say uh, friends. This is a very, as you can see, uh, impressive group of people to be associated with. I consider it personally an honor. I. Uh, don't have time to read all of the names or the institutions, but I have to point out Dan Baruch and Naya Dades, who have been extremely supportive of the program from the very beginning. But most of all, and most importantly, we thank all the investigators, their staffs, and especially the volunteers for their participation in this clinical study. And then this is a lists and lists of, or long lists of people um, internally who are working on the trial and they all have teams. So I'll start reading on the next slide. That will only take 20 minutes. Um, no. um, I want to thank you all very much uh, for allowing me to share this data and I'll take any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gretel. Open for discussions. Lord. Yes, well, I'll ask. Um, so, Frank, so can you speculate about the NHP human comparison? Does that give you more optimism and kind of question if the NHP might be a much more challenging model? But how do you see that, that difference? I, I, I think it is very encouraging, and I think it's one of the only times that we that this has really been done in a program where we have um, that kind of strategy of using the exact same um, regimens in the same way, the same timing, um, challenge, you know, waiting six months to challenge. It's a very um, uh, significant challenge. Uh, with the SHIV. So I think it's very encouraging. Uh, so I remember <clears throat> 12 years ago, the mosaic uh, vaccine was, uh, or concept was presented here in this very place in 2006. And then it was also uh, claimed and later on proven uh, that it not only, not only induces uh, T cell breadth, but also T cell depth, meaning that uh, you would uh, induce responses against several variants escape, potentially escape mutants of the same epitopes. Now, you showed data on breadth. Are there also data on depth? Mm, I am not sure that we have that data. No, I'm, the immunologists in the room on the team are helping me out graciously <laughs> and uh, shaking their heads so now. So I, um, 
I can jump in just to add that, yes, that data is being mapped now. So um, we've been mapping that with uh, different libraries of peptides, so the PTE library as well as uh, the mosaic peptide sets. Um, we've done subpool mapping, and then um, if we have enough cells, cells, we'll go even finer than that. But even with the subpool mapping, we can see that there is some depth as well to the responses. Thank you, Kate. I'm Marijn Jong from AIDSFONS. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you have any data on the amount of people that you needed to actually achieve all the the different uh, shots, uh, because I saw that you that people need to return like four or five times. Do you have any data on like the dropouts or? Um, I believe we had a ten percent dropout rate. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So last speaker is Dr. Carson Stefan Stefanson, and she is in uh, Beth Israel Harvard Medical School, and she will, uh, in, uh, related with the previous presentation, she will introduce uh, modified protocol of clinical trial, uh, AD 27, 26, mosaic, and GP140. So please. Thank you. Um, that question was a great segue to this talk, actually. So um, thank you to, the, to you guys, and thank you to the organizers for putting this session together. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a clinical trial called ipc abd 10 This is a randomized controlled trial of shorter and simpler vaccine schedules using the AD26 MOS HIV and GP140 vaccine. I have no financial interest in the outcome of this study. So the Mosaic AD26 vaccine in combination with GP140, uh, as Dr. Tamaka described, demonstrated favorable safety and tolerability in the approach clinical trial. In that study, it induced robust humoral and cellular immune responses. Um, and in the parallel monkey study, it did as well. And uh, we just heard about the long-term data from the approach. Um, it was also shown to provide 67% protection against SHIV acquisition in the monkey model. So based on that data, it has advanced into a phase 2B efficacy study in sub-Saharan Africa, the Imbicoto trial, or HVTN705. So the approach vaccine schedule includes four vaccine visits over 48 weeks, and this is the same st uh, schedule that's being studied in the efficacy study. So it starts out with two primes, primes with AD26 MOS HIV at week 0 and 12, followed by two boosts. Um, of AD26 MOS HIV in combination with GP140, and that's at weeks 24 with this later boost at week 48. So as has been mentioned, that's four vaccine visits over the course of about a year, which does raise some challenges for implementation. So what happens, for example, if doses are missed or if they are delayed? Um, and can shorter or simpler schedules be equally immunogenic? To explore those questions, we performed the ipc avd 10 study. This was a phase one randomized controlled trial, a small 36-person study at a single site at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. And in that study, we looked at uh, the same vaccine products as, as an approach. So we looked at the AD26 MOS HIV vaccine, which I'll refer to as AD, and the Clade C GP140 co-formulated with alum, which I'll call GP140. This study was co-funded by the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard, as well as Janssen, Vaccines and Prevention, and was sponsored by Janssen. So in this study, we compared three vaccine regimens. In the first group, we mirrored the approach study um, and also the same schedule as I mentioned in HVTN 705. This is where we have those two primes in the beginning, followed by two boosts at week 24 and 48 with the combination. In the second group, we wondered, what if we got rid of the prime, just did basically the boost three times, uh, the combination wrapping up the vaccines at week 24 and dropping the last boost. In the third group, we kept the prime, but we just did it one time. Let's just do prime once um, and then do the combination two times, finishing the whole regimen at week 24. 
Now, when we ran the study, each of the groups had vaccine, um, had placebos in, within the group that matched that schedule. But for this presentation, we've pulled that data together for the placebos into a, a single group. So as observed with other studies of the I-26 vector, the local and solicited adverse events were greater in the active arms versus the placebo. <coughs> Excuse me. So pain and fatigue were the most frequently reported adverse events. Most of these solicited adverse events were mild, and there were no related serious adverse events. Our conclusion was that there were different vaccine schedules were well tolerated, and in this small study, there, we didn't observe any remarkable difference between the groups. So when we looked at immunogenicity, we looked at really a huge array of assays, but I'm just going to present uh, data using the primary assays that were shown to be, uh, I think Frank said, surrogates of protection in the monkey study. So first we looked at binding antibody titers using the vaccine-matched clade C GP140 by ELISA. So here we plotted the ELISA titer for each of the participants at four different time points, baseline, week 28, week 52, and week 72. Um, to remind you guys of the schedule, I just put up on the legend there um, the weeks that the, the participants were vaccinated. So at week 28, the three groups looked remarkably similar uh, in terms of their antibody titers. Now at this time point, all of the groups had received three vaccines, and this was essentially a peak immune time point. At week 52, the shorter and simpler regimens, which are represented in blue and green, their antibody titers were coming down, which is expected after six months since their vaccine. The first group in red had that late boost and they kept their antibody titers high. But by week 72, the groups were converging again back to very similar levels. And I should point out that there was pretty much 100% response among all the participants at all of the measured time points. We also looked at antibody function. Here I'm just showing the ADCP or antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis uh, run out of the Alter Lab um, using the clade CGP140. And it's a very similar pattern uh, that we observed with the binding antibody titers. So at week 28, the three groups all looked very similar. At week 52, the group that had the late boost kept their ADCP scores up high, whereas the shorter and simpler regimens had started to drop. And then by week 72, the three groups were converging back together. The summary of our humoral immunogenicity findings were that the envelope-specific antibody responses persisted for 24 and 48 weeks in 100% of the vaccine recipients um, in, the, in all the groups. Uh, after an initial drop in the shorter regimens, the antibody levels appeared to stabilize until about a year after their last vaccine. And antibody functionality decreases faster than the binding antibody levels. So we also looked at our cellular immune responses, and here I'm just showing the envelope-specific PTE LA spot responses, and we've put up, um, we plotted the spot-forming cells per million PBMCs for the four time points. And very similar to what I already showed for the humoral immune responses, at week 28, the groups looked very similar. Um, at week 52, Maybe they started to, diver to diverge just a little bit, but at week 72, they came back together. And high frequencies of T-cell responses were seen in all of the groups through week 72. We also looked at the breadth of the T-cell responses. Here we looked at the mosaic sets and the PTE sets for Paul, Gag, and Anf, and counted up the number of subpools that were positive for each of the participants in the three groups. So at week 28, the, the, the total magnitude of the T-cell response was the same, but was the specificity any different? Um, and here we found that the specificity really wasn't that different, that the breadth was very good, um, which is nice to see with the mosaics uh, at, at, for all three of the groups. So the summary of our cellular immunogenicity findings were that envelope-specific T cells persisted at high frequencies 24 and 48 weeks after vaccination. Uh, there were comparable decreases in those vaccine-induced cellular responses um, seen at the group level, and the T cell breadth appears equivalent between the groups at week 28. So our conclusions from this small study were that no safety signals were identified and all of the regimens were well tolerated. Similar immune responses appear to be induced by all three of the vaccine regimens. <clears throat> and these results suggest that there may be some flexibility in the dosing of the mosaic I-26, I-26 plus GP140 vaccine. 
And further studies are warranted, first to look at phase one uh, studies in humans with a greater sample size, and then also looking um, at efficacy in the non-human primate model. So first I want to acknowledge our Boston community, so our clinical trial participants, our great community advisory board, which does include quite a number of HIV-infected individuals, uh, my mentor Dan Baruch at Beth Israel, Mike Seaman, and the rest of the investigators in our clinical trial unit, our collaborators at Janssen, particularly Frank Tamaka and Dan Stee, who helped with the analysis, Bruce Walker and Galit <clears throat> uh, Alter at the Reagan Institute. We conducted our study at the Harvard Catalyst Clinical Research Center, and also my funding from the Reagan Institute and the NIH. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So open home discussions. Listen. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see any difference for Ig subclass or IgA between the sequential immunization versus core delivery of ad and protein? We haven't seen any specific difference between the groups so far. We just see the same pattern where there's the they look equivalent at week 28, then week 52. You know, maybe the subclasses the the magnitude will be. Um, a little bit higher still for the first group, and then they converge again. So for all of the assays that we've looked at so far, it's really just kind of the same pattern over and over. Um, but we haven't seen a qualitative difference like that between the groups. I am a little bit interested in the comparison between group two and group three. Mm -hmm. So week eight and week 12, uh, a second immunization. Do we have? Uh, did you find any difference between uh, these two groups on uh, the response just after the second immunization? Yeah, so the, you know, really the question is, does it matter if you have that viral vector prime, that pure prime? And I think it's hard to determine that from this data. I think we can look at some of the assay results and see perhaps some differences between group two and three, but they're very hard to make conclusions because the sample sizes are so small. So I think that is something that we need to explore in the follow-up studies with larger sample size. Okay. So, okay. All right, thank you. So thank you very much. So, uh, this brings us to the end of our um, session from conception to delivery, the vaccine discovery pipeline. I think we saw some uh, concepts that were closer to conception and some that were um, very much close to delivery. A very exciting data. I thank all the speakers for their presentations and for keeping mostly in time. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you all took something away from this session. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, and thanks very much. Bye-bye. Okay.